So this is our last uh, few slides in the aortic stenosis uh, guidelines. So we're just going to go over them. Um, so <clears throat> aortic stenosis is fairly common, and uh, we need to identify patients with aortic stenosis, and we need to know how to manage them. Um, because if we do a fairly good job, then you know patients will do very well. Um, if you remember <clears throat> when we're discussing patients with low gradient uh, aortic stenosis, you know that is if the patients have a valve area less than one centimeter squared and a mean gradient <clears throat> less than forty, and that would stand that the the peak velocity is less than four meters per second. <clears throat> then there are some additional stuff. If you see them, then it points towards uh, severe aortic stenosis. And you know we, we're talking about the physical examination. So when you examine the patient, um, there are certain physical physical examination features that would point towards severe aortic uh, stenosis. Um, you know, if the patient is older, if the patient is older than 70, then um, if, if they have these parameters, then it's probably severe aortic stenosis. Um, if the patient have LVH, left ventral hypertrophy, and, um, you know, they have a history of hypertension, then it's probably severe aortic stenosis. And then there's something I call reduced longitudinal function. So remember when the heart contracts, the, if you're looking at it longitudinally, the base moves up towards the apex. And we, we talk about strain. So we talk about a global uh, longitudinal strain. And that is reduced. So if you see those things, points towards severe aortic stenosis. Again, um, if the mean gradient is between 30 and 40, the valve area less than 0.8, and um, you, you have a, a, a low flow situation. Remember, low flow is defined as a stroke volume index less than 35 mLs per meter squared. Um, but one of the most important uh, features is if you see a lot of calcification. So if there's a lot of calcification, and um, this is calcification use, using multi-slice CT scan. And we're talking about uh, for men, if it's greater than 2,000, and this is um, the Agaston unit. So this is the Agaston unit. From, so for for males, if it's more than 2,000, then it's probably severe. Um, for female, if it's greater than 1,200. So a lot of calcification suggests that, um, suggests that it's probably severe stenosis. So again, it's crucial that we, we are comfortable in, in diagnosing aortic stenosis in the echo lab because that is where you're going to see most of the patients. I mean, 30 years ago, uh, we used to see these patients in the cath lab. Now, ECHO is very good at um, making the, 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 the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis. And um, so we don't have to take them to the cath lab unless we need to look at the coronary arteries. All right. So... LV hypertrophy and uh, uh, LV change uh, and, and changing the LV function in response to AS. Um, as we talk about the longitudinal reduction in the longitudinal strain. As we mentioned before, severe aortic stenosis can cause a depression in the LV systolic function. Also, you, 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 you will have patients with disease state that reduce 
LV systolic function and they develop aortic stenosis on top of that. So you should try to separate out these two groups because if you have a patient who have reduced LV systolic function as a result of aortic stenosis, when you fix the aortic stenosis, the LV function should improve. That's not the case if you say, if you have a patient with a cardiomyopathy, a, a idiopathic cardiomyopathy, or even cardiomyopathy secondary to coronary artery disease, and if they have a concomitant aortic uh, stenosis, you fix the aortic stenosis, it's not going to do much for the depressed LV systolic function. So it's important to separate out these groups. Again, when we look at LV systolic function, we tend to 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 do um, or you know the 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 the, the modified Simpson uh, rule. Uh, we look at the end diastolic volume, the end systolic volume, and we get an ejection fraction. But in in aortic stenosis, before the ejection fraction falls. You, you may see a reduction in global longitudinal strain. And then that is telling you that the LV systolic function is beginning to fail. So looking at ejection fraction in the usual manner is probably not the best method to evaluate LV systolic function. Um, we should be looking at global longitudinal strain. And again, remember, when the heart contracts longitudinally, the base moves up towards the apex. And when we talk about the strain, it's essentially the percentage change from your diastolic to your systolic uh, dimension. Um, so again, it's crucial that you distinguish reduction in LV systolic function resulting from aortic stenosis uh, as compared to someone who have a, a reduced LV systolic function because of something else, okay? And the importance is if the reduction in ejection fraction is as a result of aortic stenosis, when you fix the aortic stenosis, when you relieve the obstruction, the LV systolic function should improve. And again, the global longitudinal strain um, is, is probably the way to go, all right? So LV hypertrophy, that is thickening of the heart muscle. It commonly occurs in aortic stenosis and, you know, if you have an obstruction and the heart has to work hard, sometimes the muscle thickens. But a lot of these patients with aortic stenosis, they also have chronic hypertension. And as a result of the hypertension, the, 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 the myocardium thickens, okay? Um, so it could, be, it could be secondary to the aortic stenosis or uh, underlying hypertension. Also, in, in your older female, remember in your elderly female, I mean, those patients may have a small LV cavity, and because they have a small LV cavity, the, 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 the left ventricular cavity may be small, and as a result of that, the stroke volume is going to be reduced. The, 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 the velocity across the aortic valve is gonna, gonna be reduced. And then the gradient across the valve is gonna be reduced as a result of uh, reduction in the velocity. Um, so you, you have to, to bear that in mind uh, when you're evaluating these patients. Um, again, if you're talking about a very small person then you can index the valve area, okay? So when, when you index the valve area, whatever valve area you get, 
on your continent uh, on your continuity equation, you're going to divide it by the, the body surface area. And um, that is how to normalize that. And uh, excessive hypertrophy also will impact the outcome. So if someone has significant uh, left ventricular hypertrophy with the aortic stenosis, they tend to have a, a somewhat worse prognosis. So just to summarize uh, the integrated stepwise approach to grading aortic stenosis. So someone comes to you and they have aortic stenosis. Remember, if if the aortic stenosis is moderate or mild, you know, we, we, we're going to follow them. So those are not the patients we're talking about. The patients that we're talking about is the one who look like they have severe aortic stenosis. So let's look at the stepwise approach again. Um, again, it, 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 this is fairly challenging. So you, you have to have a, a algorithm, so to speak. So the things that you're going to look for, the patient comes, the things that you're going to look for and the things that you're going to integrate is the velocity and the gradient. So you need to get good velocity, good gradient, okay? Then you're going to calculate the valve area using the continuity equation. You're going to look at the valve, the valve mor morphology. You're going to look, is there a lot of calcification in the valve? Is the valve opening well? You know, is the valve thickened? Then you're going to look at the flow rate, and remember we 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 talk about a low flow, um, so that we use the, the 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 stroke volume index. Okay, so less than 35 mLs per meter square. That is well, that's the definition for 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 a low flow. Um, we look at the LV morphology, that is, is there thickening uh, of the myocardium? And then we look at the function. Remember, ejection fraction is important. And when the patient comes for the study, you're going to record a patient's blood pressure and if they have any symptoms. Okay? So we're going to put all of these together to, to, to come up with a, you know, a grade for the patient then, so to speak. So our two-dimensional echo is going to give us our morphologic assessment of the aortic valve. So we can look at the, the valve. Is there a lot of calcification? Is the valve opening well? So that's your two-dimensional uh, echo. Thickening calcification, reduction in the cusp uh, motion. Is there domain? Um, is there fused commissure? So you know, you can get tip tip off if the, if the commissures are fused. If the if the um if the commissures are fused, then you you know you're talking about a rheumatic aortic stenosis. So that will tell you, you know, what type of aortic stenosis you're dealing with, um, as opposed to your senile degenerative um, calcification. Okay, so just looking at it. Using your two-dimensional echo is going to give you a lot of information. All right, so in our stepwise integrated approach, step one is to assess the transvalvular peak velocity and the mean gradient. So remember, you need remember you need to 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 look at the peak velocity across the aortic valve and the mean gradient, and that's very important. So you always want to do a good study. So you have to, you know, try your best to, 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 to do it properly, OK? I mean, you can make uh, tons of errors if, it, if it's not done properly. Um, You have to use multiple windows. You have to use multiple windows. You can't use one or two because we use a Doppler technique to, to, to look at velocity 
and as a result, gradients. And that, that the angle between the ultrasound beam and the moving red blood cell is crucial. You want to be as parallel to, to, to the flow as possible. So you cannot predict beforehand which window is going to give you the, 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 the maximum velocity and the, the maximum mean gradient. Okay? So you do, you know, you take all precautions, multiple windows, and you use your PDOF probe. A velocity greater than four meters per second or a mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters mercury, it indicates what we call an I gradient AS. Okay? So this is your typical patient who have aortic stenosis. Okay? The typical patient is going to have a velocity greater than four meters per second and a mean gradient greater than 40 millimeters mercury. But you know, for 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 for, for clarity, let's call these patients a high gradient uh, AS. Okay. Now, or patients with the high gradient AS. So again, we suspect aortic stenosis. We look at the, the, the valve using our two-dimensional echo, thickened, not open and calcified, everything. Then we do our Doppler. You do your, you have to use continuous wave Doppler because now we're talking about velocity greater than 1.5 meters per second. So you have to use continuous wave Doppler. So we do our Doppler across the aortic valve, multiple windows, you want to get the maximum velocity and gradient. And if your velocity is greater than four meters per second, the gradient is greater than 40 millimeters mercury, then that's a high gradient track. So this track may be considered as an easy track, because this is the regular patients with severe aortic stenosis. A high gradient generally indicates severe aortic stenosis. Uh, whether Severe eye gradient AS is associated with normal flow, low flow, it doesn't matter. If they can, if they presented those number and the valve area is less than one centimeter squared, they have severe aortic stenosis. Okay? Whether the EF is normal or the EF is reduced, it doesn't matter. Okay? The fact that they can generate a velocity greater than four meters per second and a mean gradient greater than 40 that is fine you don't need to go any further it's okay so the only patients that we are concerned about in this high gradient as track is if when you do the flow the stroke volume index is greater than 58 mils per meter squared so this is telling that they really have a tremendous flow this is very high flow, okay? This is a very high flow. And patients with these very high flow, usually they're anemic, they may have a fever, they may have hyperthyroidism, or they may have a fistula. So these are not a common patient, okay? So again, the, the, the stroke volume, very, very high, suggests that something is going on in this patient. So what you want to do is treat the underlying problem, and when the stroke volume normalizes, then you repeat the, 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 your assessment of the aortic stenosis, okay? So remember that. So again, the things that can give rise to such a very high uh, flow is anemia, hyperthyroidism, fistulas, AV fistulas, arterial venous fistulas. So patients with dialysis graph and stuff like that, they will come in. I mean, someone with a dialysis graph, they're not going to normalize because the graph is there, you know, for a very long time. So if they have those numbers and if the valve area is much less than 
one centimeter squared. And again, when you look at it, the valve is calcified. It doesn't look like it moving and all that sort of stuff. That is more than likely severe. So, you know. So, the next step in the eye gradient is, is to exclude this very high flow state. I, you know, if the patient is febrile, hyperthyroidism, or if it's, you're going to know that. So you're going to know it. And you, you know, when, when, the, when the condition uh, is reversed, then you can repeat the study and uh, get your numbers. So that's the easy track. Now, the, the, you know, a little bit more difficult track is the low gradient. So remember the, you remember the cutoff, so you have to remember the cutoff. So your low gradient AS track is the patient with the velocity, which is less than four meters per second, and the mean gradient less than 40. So you have to remember the cutoff, okay? Um, so, you have those numbers, velocity less than four, the, 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 the mean gradient less than 40. If the valve area you calculate is greater than one centimeter squared, then the patient does not have severe aortic stenosis. So you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. So you calculate the valve area using the continuity equation. If it's greater than one centimeter squared, they, they don't have severe aortic stenosis. Remember, we're really concerned about the severe because these patients, we're going to follow them, you know, periodically. And when they get into the severe category, we, we, will, we will know. So if you calculate the, the valve area and it's less than one centimeter squared, it suggests aortic stenosis. It may not be because they have a low gradient, they have a low flow situation. So remember, in that group, in that low flow group, if the ejection fraction is very low, then the heart muscle may, is maybe not strong enough to open the valve. Remember, the valve, the valve has to be open. So the patient may not have severe aortic stenosis, just that if the ejection fraction is 20%, the heart muscle is not strong enough to open the valve. But when you do your calculation, you're going to get less than one centimeter squared. So you have to separate that group of patients from the patient who really have severe aortic stenosis. So... The first thing you're going to do, you're going to check your measurements. Always check your measurements. All of your measurements, every single one. You need to go over it. You need to look at your, how you, you measure the LVOT diameter. Did you measure it properly? If you're getting 2.7 or you're getting something ridiculous as 1.2, you have to recheck it. You have to recheck it and make sure that, you know, you didn't make the errors. You're also going to check the peak velocity, you're going to check the mean gradient, you're going to recalculate the valve area, okay? So all the components that contribute to the aortic valve area calculation, you should check, okay? Now, again, the definition for your low flow situation is that the stroke volume index is less than 35 ml per meter square, okay? Again, stroke volume is the volume of blood that's pump, pumped out of the ventricle per beat. Okay. Now, if the patient have, uh, if the patient have a normal flow, um, All right, anyway, let's skip over that. All right, so if low flow is present, 
defined by the, the stroke volume index less than 35 ml per meter square. Okay. So you have to evaluate further. And the thing you need to do is look at the ejection fraction. So the patient have a velocity less than four meters per second, a gradient less than 40. And when you do the stroke volume index, it is low. The next thing you do is to do the ejection fraction. If your ejection fraction is less than 50%, then you're talking about a low flow, low gradient AS with reduced ejection fraction. Now you're in a, 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 a dilemma because is it the patient have true aortic stenosis or is it a situation that because the patient have reduced ejection fraction, they cannot open the valve. You have to separate those two patients because one is going to do well with surgery and the other one is not going to do well. So you have to separate them. And what, how we separate them is to do the debutamine stress, stress test. Okay? When we give the debutamine, we want to see a 20% increase in the stroke volume. 20% increase in the stroke volume. And if you give your debutamine and you get your 20% increase and the valve area is still less than one centimeter squared, then that's true, your stenosis. If you give your debutamine and the valve area um, is now more than one, then it's that's pseudo. That's pseudo. That's not true. Okay? So it is crucial to distinguish those two groups. Okay? I mean, you know, one of the things, I mean, in, in, in our calculation, we assume the LVOT to be circular, where it's not really circular. And that can affect your calculation sometime, but don't worry about that. So this, this is, this is uh, the, the algorithm that you should follow. It, it looks fairly busy, but, you know, um, the same thing that we have been saying, patient comes to you, okay? Um, you're gonna look at the velocity and gradient. For low gradient, we're talking about the, the velocity less than four meters per second, the mean gradient less than 40. For your eye gradient patient, you know, the velocity more than four meters per second, mean gradient. So this is the easy patient. And if the valve area is less than one centimeter squared, they have, through aortic stenosis, and that settles that, nothing else. But you know, you can have a patient with very, very high flow. Your patient who is anemic, hyperthyroid, uh, that the, the, the stroke volume index is going to be greater than 58 ml per meter square. Those patients, you, you, you treat the underlying problem. When they're more stable, then you repeat the evaluation for aortic stenosis. Okay? Um, so this is the, the, the more difficult group. Um, you want to separate the true aortic stenosis from the false or the pseudo-aortic stenosis patients, okay? If the patient have a reduction in the ejection fraction, okay? So the valve, if the valve is less than one centimeter squared, it could be true or it could be false. Um, if, if the patient have a reduction in the um, in the ejection fraction, and you give the butamin and the valve area is now more than one centimeter squared. Then that's not that's false. So, okay. Um, so to to if you wanna so to to define low flow again the stroke volume index. Normal flow is greater than 35, okay? So patients with low gradient, low velocity, velocity less than four, gradient less than 40, and if you do the ejection fraction, if the ejection fraction is low, then you have to do the, the butamine. 
the W domain is going to separate your pseudo AS from your true AS. Okay. Um, if the patient have uh, severe AS and the ejection fraction is greater than 50%, but they have low flow, this is a little little old lady with a small LV cavity. Uh, you know, they 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 do poorly with surgery, but you know, that's probably your only option. You know, so. But like how we, we, you know, remember we can do TAVR now. So, you know, we, 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 the, the mortality from um, replacing the valve is not as high with TAVR. Okay. So that concludes or the, the guidelines, the updated guidelines. So you have to be able to accurately uh, identify patients with severe aortic stenosis and then, you know, know how to manage them appropriately.